Good morning and welcome to Central Presbyterian Church's online worship service for this Sunday, November 8th, 2020. I'm your lay reader, Zach Cosner. I invite you to download the bulletin for today's service, which can be found at our website, www.centralprespb.com. Uh, click on the publications link at the top, scroll down until you see today's uh, date, and you can download the bulletin there. Um, you can also find the link to the bulletin in the description under the, this video on Facebook and on YouTube. Now that you've acquired the bulletin, I ask that you turn your attentions to the announcements found on the back of that bulletin. Neighbors Neighbor has asked us for a donation of 50 cans of cranberry sauce by November 23rd for their Christmas um, uh, dinners uh, that they give away. Uh, for more information on where to drop them off, uh, contact us on social media. You can find us at username Central Prez PB. Um, it is stewardship season. Look for your pledge cards in, uh, in the mail, hopefully this week. As a thank you, we'll be taking reservations to pick up a chicken and dressing meal prepared, prepared by the Von Tunglins on November 22nd. You can either mail back your pledge cards or drop them off when you pick up your meal. Uh, contact Susie via phone or CPC via social media to RSVP for your meal. We greatly appreciate it. Again, the session of CPC has decided to stick with virtual uh, services for the foreseeable future. Keep in contact with us via social media or at our website for announcements on any special services and when we plan to resume in-person worship. Archives of our online services can be found on Facebook as, and YouTube, as I said before. Links to each are on our website, centralprespb.com. Now let us prepare our hearts and minds to worship the Lord. Give ear, O my people, to my teaching. Incline your ears to the words of my mouth. We will tell of your glorious deeds, O Lord, and the wonders that you have done. Tell your children and your children's children that they should set their hope in God and not forget your works, O God, but keep your commandments. Let us worship God. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, God who is faithful and just will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Please join me for the prayer of confession. And first in unison found uh, using the prayer uh, printed in the bulletin and then silently. Almighty God, what a heritage we have in you. You grant, have granted us salvation and protection and have loved us despite our betrayals and ingratitude. Yet we have failed to appreciate our legacy. We do not know the stories well, nor do we tell them with much wonder. We forsake you as we forget your glorious works on our behalf, our dependence upon you, and our responsibility to the covenant we share. Forgive us, O oh God, and remind us what you have done, that we might neither grieve nor despair, but find hope in your promises and, res and resolve to serve you, our Lord. And now silently. Amen. The good news in Christ is that when we face ourselves and God with the awareness of our need, we are given grace to grow and courage to continue the journey. Friends, believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Amen. And now we're going to go ahead and turn over to uh, Reverend Tim Reeves uh, for this week's uh, sermon, Perceptions Matter. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. Our scripture reading this morning comes from the 25th chapter of the Gospel according to Matthew, beginning with the 14th verse and proceeding through verse 30. Let us listen for the word of the Lord. For it is as if a man going on a journey summoned his slaves and entrusted his property to them. To one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one, or to another one, to each according to his ability. Then he went away. 
the one who had received the five talents went off at once and traded with them and made five more talents. In the same way, the one who had the two talents made two more talents. But the one who had received one talent went off and dug a hole in the ground and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of those slaves came and settled accounts with them. Then the one who had received the five talents came forward, bringing five more talents, saying, Master, you handed over to me five talents. See, I have made five more talents. His master said to him, Well done, good and trustworthy slave. You have been trustworthy in a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. And the one with the two talents also came forward saying, Master, you handed over to me two talents. See, I have made two more talents. His master said to him, Well done, good and trustworthy slave. You have been trustworthy in a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. Then the one who had received the one talent also came forward saying, Master, I knew that you were a harsh man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you did not scatter seed. So I was afraid, and I went and hid your talent in the ground. Here you have what is yours. But his master replied, You wicked and lazy slave. You knew, did you, that I reap where I did not sow and gather where I did not scatter? Then you ought to have invested my money with the bankers, and on my return I would have received what was my own with interest. So take the talent from him and give it to the one with the ten talents. For to all those who have, more will be given, and they will have an abundance. But from those who have nothing, even what they have will be taken away. As for this worthless slave, throw him into the outer darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Open now our hearts and minds, O God, by the power and presence of your Holy Spirit, so that as your word is proclaimed this day, we may hear with joy what it is you would have us hear, that hearing we might believe, and that believing we might live lives of richer and fuller service glorifying you here on earth as you are glorified in heaven. Amen. The renowned American journalist H. L. Mencken once defined Puritanism as the haunting fear that someone somewhere may be happy. And over the years that sentiment has morphed into a critique of all religious people as those with a terrible and pervasive fear that someone somewhere may be having fun. I'd like for you to keep that in the back of your minds. On another occasion, Mencken would write, the chief contribution of Protestantism to human thought is its massive proof that God is a bore. I want you to keep that in the back of your minds as well, because while we may bristle at such characterizations, there can be no denying that there is more than a slight element of truth in those words. For all of our talk about joy and hope and a peace which surpasses understanding, the people of God spent an incredible amount of time living lives that say just the opposite. We prefer an existence that is safe and secure. We embrace an understanding of faithfulness 
that expects little or nothing of us. Our lives are, more often than not, governed by fear and worry. We speak of God's loving acceptance of us while harboring deep-seated doubts about ever measuring up. We throw around a word like grace while trembling in fear at the prospect of judgment. So, the lives of many of us are governed by the notions of better and better not. You'd better do this, or you'll feel God's wrath. You'd better not do that, or God will get you. It has been an effective way of ensuring obedience for centuries. Play on people's fears, and they are easily controlled. And many a Christian church has operated on this very premise. But the trouble is that that premise is not Christian. In fact, it's rather demonic when you think about it. It's manipulative, it's devious, and it utterly misrepresents the gospel. The gospel teaches us, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son, so that everyone who believes in him <clears throat> may not perish, but may have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. The gospel assures us <clears throat> that, <clears throat> sorry, that God is love, and those who abide in love abide in God, and God abides in them. Love has been perfected in, among us in this, that we may have boldness on the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, for fear has to do with punishment. And whoever fears has not reached perfection in love. Thus we read in the fourth chapter of 1 John. The ever-present love of God is a far better motivation to love God and neighbor than that of fear. Controlling people with fear is a good way to create automatons, but it does not create people of faith. Controlling people with fear is a good way to get them to do as they are told, but that is all they are likely to do, no more and no less. Controlling people with fear is a good way to keep people in line, but it does not allow for creativity or imagination or the all-important leap of faith. It seems to me that faith based on the notions of better and better not looks very much like the terrible and pervasive fear that someone somewhere may be having fun. And those notions run completely counter to God's will that we live abundant and joy-filled lives. I'm reminded of a rather sad scene in the book The Last Battle, which is C.S. Lewis's seventh and final book in his Chronicles of Narnia series. In it, <clears throat> Aslan the lion returns to take all of his friends to the new Narnia, a place of astonishing light and beauty, a place where every blade of grass seems to mean more and where every creature sings for the sheer joy of being in the presence of its creator. But then in the midst of all of this splendor, Lucy, one of the main characters in the series, sees a group of dwarfs huddled together, convinced that they are sitting in the rank stench of a barn, a place so dark that they cannot see their hands in front of their faces. And Lucy is so upset that the dwarfs are not enjoying the new Narnia that she begs Aslan to help them see. Aslan responds, Dearest, I will show you both what I can and what I cannot do. 
He came up to the dwarfs and gave a low growl. Low, but it set all the air shaking. But the dwarfs said to one another, hear that? That's the gang at the other end of the stable. They're trying to frighten us. They do it with a machine of some kind. Don't take any notice. They won't take us in again. Aslan then raised his head and shook his mane, and instantly a glorious feast appeared on the dwarf's knees, and each dwarf had a goblet of good wine in his right hand. But even that wasn't much use. They began eating and drinking greedily enough, but it was clear that they couldn't taste it properly. They thought, indeed they were convinced, that they were eating and drinking only the sort of things you might find in a stable. One said he was trying to eat hay, and another said he had a bit of an old turnip, and a third said he found a raw cabbage leaf. Then they raised their golden goblets of rich red wine to their lips and said, Ugh, fancy drinking water out of a trough that a donkey's been at. Never thought we'd come to this. You see, Aslan says to Lucy, they will not let us help them. They have chosen cunning instead of belief. Their prison is in their own minds, yet they are in that prison and so afraid of being taken in that they cannot be taken out. Perceptions matter. These dwarfs found themselves in a hell of their own devising and of their own choosing. And I believe that something similar is going on with the third servant in this morning's parable from Matthew. We should note that this story opens with an act of great generosity and trust. A master entrusted his property to his slaves. To one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one, to each according to his ability. Now the talents mentioned here are not special abilities, rather the talent was a sum of money. We might think of talents as bags of gold because a talent was the equivalent of 15 years worth of salary for a day laborer. So we are talking about huge amounts of money, perhaps more money than any of them would have ever expected to see in their lifetime. Giving such an unimaginable, unimaginable amount of money away would seem to indicate the master's confidence in these people and is a shorthand way of getting at the idea that this story begins with grace. And the rest of the parable is how each slave responded to that grace, which is always the issue before us. How will we respond to God's grace? We're told that the first two immediately set out to invest the money they had been given and ended up with doubling, or ended up doubling their investments. But the third one immediately went out and buried the talent that he had been given. Now, apparently this was a common practice back then. By burying the money in the ground, the third slave would have been relieving himself of any responsibility for that money. If someone came along and found and stole this money, which was also common in those days, then the slave would have been free and clear of any blame or requirement to pay restitution. Perceptions matter. The first two appear to be eager beavers, unable to contain the joy that they feel at their master's trust and generosity. But the third one is paralyzed by fear. His world seems to be governed by the notions of better or better not. He has a real sense that if he fails, that he will incur 
the master's wrath. The fact that the first two slaves doubled their investments and then hear the words, well done, good and trustworthy slave, you have been trustworthy in a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master would initially seem to support such a view. But as one who has failed as often as I have succeeded, I wonder what might have happened had one or both of those first two slaves lost everything in their attempt to invest the talents entrusted to them. Would they have incurred the master's wrath? Or would they have nevertheless heard the words, well done, good and trustworthy slave? Perceptions matter. And my perceptions of who God reveals God's self to be in the pages of Scripture lead me to conclude that, of course, they would have heard the words, well done, good and trustworthy slave, even if they had lost everything. Because nowhere in the pages of scripture, does God ever call any of us to be successful? God merely calls us to be faithful. And in our Lord Jesus Christ, we see one who risked and lost everything, at least according to how the world judges success. He invested everything in a sinful and broken humanity and was crucified. Perceptions matter. And clearly, the third slave misjudged his master, distorting the master into some sort of tough, hard-hearted, and uncaring ruler. Is there any wonder that he acted out of fear? And that, I think, is the truly tragic aspect of this parable, because the third slave pronounces his own judgment. He gets the only master his warped perception can envision. This is not a story about a generous master who suddenly turns cruel. It's about living with the consequences of one's own faith. If one trusts the goodness of God, one can boldly venture out with eyes wide open to the grace in life and can discover the joy of God's providence everywhere. But to be a child of a generous, gracious, and life-giving God and nonetheless insist upon viewing God as oppressive, cruel, and fear-provoking is to live a life that is tragically impoverished. So says Thomas Long. He goes on to say, for those who live in the confidence that God is trustworthy and generous, they find more and more of that generosity. But for those who run and hide under the bed from a bad, mean, and scolding God, they condemn themselves to a life spent under the bed alone, quivering in needless fear. Such disciples never grow, and their unused faith becomes useless. Growth requires change. Change involves risk, and risk requires trust. Time and time again, in the pages of Scripture, God shows that God is trustworthy. The one who holds tomorrow is the one who holds us in the palm of his hand. The one who calls us to risk is the one who risked everything for our sake. And the one who calls us to share the gospel is the one who equips us to do that work. Perceptions matter. The question before us is, do we perceive a God whose wrath we will incur 
if we don't do as we should? Or do we perceive a God whose greatest joy is to see us take a leap of faith? Does our faith say that we are afraid that someone somewhere may be having fun? Or does our faith say that we have entered into the joy of our master? Perceptions matter. To God be all the honor, glory, and praise forever. Amen. I would ask now at this time that you would please join me and confirm what it is we believe using the words of the Apostles' Creed that can be found in your bulletin. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us now return to God our thanksgiving through our tithes and offerings, which is going to be taken electronically again this week. You can head to our website, www.centralprespb.com. Click on the Donate Now link on the top right-hand corner of the page. Um, you can, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, you can um, uh, make your tithe there. Or if you uh, prefer, you can mail your tithe to 6300 Trinity Drive, Pine Bluff, Arkansas, 71603. It is right and our greatest joy to give you thanks, eternal God, for all the blessings that you have bestowed upon us. But we are most grateful for the gift of your Son, Jesus Christ, and your abiding and sustaining Holy Spirit. For our Lord reconciled us to you and to one another, opening the door to eternal life. Your Holy Spirit continues to confront us, convict us, correct us, and equip us to enter the world and share the good news of your redeeming grace. And so, O oh God, we offer up our time, our talents, our treasures, and indeed our very selves for you to use as you see fit until that most glorious day when, excuse me, at the name of Jesus, every knee in heaven and on earth and under the earth shall bend and every tongue shall confess him, Lord, to your honor and glory. Amen. At this time, we will share any joys and concerns, which we have a, a, a few. Um, uh, we were asked to continue to pray for Brad Von Tungland. Uh The medicines that he's been given to uh, treat his medical condition have been giving him um, some discomfort recently. Um, Scarlett Munn uh, has had a, a minor procedure uh, this week. Uh, she's in a little bit of pain, so we, we need to continue to keep her in our prayers. Um, Rose and Susie notified us that Dale Chambliss, their brother-in-law, has contracted COVID-19. Um, we need to keep uh, him in our prayers as well. And we've also asked him to, be continue, uh, to continue prayer for Anita Rodriguez, who's continuing to have medical issues. Uh, we will also um, continue to keep um, everyone who has COVID-19 in our prayers as well. Um, let us pray. Heavenly Father, uh, please be with Brad, Scarlett, Anita, and Dale as they face these medical issues. Uh, please guide the, uh, the doctor's hands, uh, make, give them the wisdom and the power to, um, to heal these individuals. Uh, please continue to be with all who deal with COVID-19. Uh, the first responders, the retail workers, those who are on the front lines, our doctors and our nurses, our, um, our police and our uh, correctional uh, officers, um, please continue to be with um, those who have lost loved ones to this uh, horrible disease. Uh, also, we pray that now that <laughs> the election season has passed, that we as a, a country can be reconciled to you and that we 
discern your will for our nation and that we uh, heal our divisions and and look at look at ourselves and, and see where we are lacking and um, um, that we do your will to to improve upon our nation holy and gracious father we give you thanks that the lord jesus christ is in fact the same today as he was yesterday and will be for our for all of our tomorrows give us hope as we strive to be faithful disciples of jesus christ who taught us to pray together saying our father who art in heaven hallowed be thy name thy kingdom come thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil for that is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever amen now go out into the world in peace to love and serve the lord rejoicing in the power and the presence of god's holy spirit taking today's message with you and may the grace of our lord jesus christ the love of god and the communion of the holy spirit be with you all now and forevermore Amen.